Hi, I'm Mark Terrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to the Slave Driver Inside, Treating Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, or OCD. Now, a client said to me once, I'm possessed by a slave driving, merciless control freak devil. And that's how Susan, this client, described obsessive compulsive disorder when she came to see me for treatment. And it was the first time I'd heard it described quite so uh, evocatively, but I treated enough cases to know she wasn't just trying to be dramatic, that actually it does feel like a slave driver, something making you do something. OCD can manifest in many different ways, but there are always a few things in common. Now, there were dark circles under her eyes and slumping shoulders and a sense of defeat. And we often see this in the OCD sufferer, that they look almost haunted. They're enslaved to the unrelenting tyrant that is OCD. So obsessive compulsive disorder can present as uh, persistent thoughts or feelings or images in the mind or even imagined sounds. A forceful need to perform rituals such as checking or uh, washing in an attempt to subdue the obsessive feelings or avert some imagined disaster. So there's a kind of magical thinking element to it. Uh, it might consist of continual doubt over important or even minor matters, a sense of anxious questioning in the mind. And just as with some addictions, there seems to be an element of habituation with OCD in that more and more checking or cleaning is required to get the same reassurance hit, meaning more and more time is spent serving OCD's unreasonable demands. And OCD itself thrives on stress, which is why it will often begin during, um, for example, academic test times or during a difficult life period or after a divorce or when a child goes to a new school and so forth. But why do some people develop OCD during stressful periods and other people don't? You know, what's the difference? Where does this overblown need for control, for reassurance, come from? Now, we all need to feel some control in our lives. You know, having a sense of influence is important for all of us. But for some people, that need for control is really important. And sometimes this pattern of thinking can emerge in people with perfectionistic tendencies. There's a kind of magical thinking inherent within OCD. I can avert some disaster and therefore control reality if I count to 1,000 or wash my hands 500 times. Some OCD sufferers come from very powerless childhoods in which inner control was a substitute for such minuscule outer control. So one man, Keith, told me how his parents had severely abused him, both physically and mentally, no matter how he behaved or communicated with him. So, you know, no matter what he did, he, he was abused and punished. And he felt totally powerless because he couldn't even determine whether he was punished or not. But at night, he'd walk around his bed 50 times before getting into it. And he felt that somehow this would make his parents less angry with him. And in that way, he clawed back some sense of control, like trying to appease some angry god with some ritual. So perfectionism, or an amplified need to feel in control, safe and secure, really drives OCD. This need may have arisen from times of stress in which the OCD sufferer felt little or no control over events and situations. But there's another element to OCD. So why OCD is like a dream for some people, or a nightmare, in fact. OCD is driven by stress. But it's also vital to understand that it has trance-like elements to it. So OCD clients often talk of being tranced out and totally focused on their obsessive thoughts and feelings and rituals to the point where the outside world or other concerns just completely fade away. They might um, forget time passing whilst washing their hands a thousand times. And it's like coming out of trance when they come out of it. Therapeutic hypnosis often creates a sense of time distortion with clients, feeling quite unaware of the length of time they spent in hypnotic trance. 
Sometimes afterwards, they have some amnesia for the hypnotic experience, or it seems hazy to recollect, at least consciously. In naturally occurring but counterproductive trance states, such as OCD, you often find these same hypnotic elements. Someone with OCD may experience amnesia for the experience of checking or washing and forget they actually have checked or washed. They can't remember whether they switched off the gas. And it's because of this naturally occurring hypnotic element to OCD that therapists increasingly use hypnotic techniques to actually treat obsessive compulsive disorder. One thing I always do with obsessionality is to normalize it. People often feel weird for having weird thoughts, as if they must be crazy or something. But actually, anyone with any imagination at some point has had a weird thought. Sometimes it's prompted by fear or anxiety or boredom even, which is a form of stress, of course. Some weird thought might come into your head. The mistake that people then make is to assume that they must be really weird for having this weird thought. But we can distinguish between being weird and having a weird thought. Many people who are not suicidal uh, imagine hurling themselves off a building or attacking somebody or doing something that would uh, they'd never do in reality. But because it's the worst thing they can possibly think of and perhaps are a bit bored, they imagine themselves doing it. And then because they thought that, they become scared of the thought. I'll often talk in terms of free-floating anxiety needing a shape and a form. So like water, anxiety will want to find a channel to fill to give it some shape. So will free-floating anxiety if it's not focused on something real. So we'll imagine something to be frightened of because it's, it, it feels um, unnatural just to have fear without actually being frightened of anything. If a person for whatever reason feels stressed and anxious and perturbed, and then if nothing's going on in the environment right now that is actually threatening, if they have a good imagination, they'll use it badly and they'll spontaneously form a shape for the anxiety to fill because anxiety doesn't like a vacuum. So we can describe that process to our clients. It could be that they've said something terrible to someone uh, and that person's upset with them, or it could be some worry that they concoct and create that's not a real threat in, in actuality. I worked with a nurse who would come home from work and be terrified she'd made a mistake at work uh, which had led to the death of a patient, and that somehow she'd given them the wrong drugs or done something wrong. She didn't even know what it was. She was a very meticulous person, but this thought would obsess her every single night. Another client, a guy, would have to walk back the way he'd driven back from work because he thought maybe he'd run over somebody without noticing that he'd run them over. So he wanted to walk back um, on, on the same way to see whether somebody had been injured or there was blood on the road or anything like that, as if he could have killed someone without even noticing. He'd watch the news each night obsessively to try to discover whether somebody had been killed uh, on the route or if you're in America, route, uh, on the way back from work. People with those types of obsessive thoughts often don't trust their own perception and their imagination takes over. And we can frame it as imagination. And we can talk in terms of you can think anything, but you don't have to buy into it. You can imagine anything, but you can be quite separate from it. As Stephen King, the horror writer, imagines all kinds of stuff. Frank Herbert or someone like that imagined all kinds of stuff, of horrors, and they make a living out of using their imagination in horrifying ways, but they don't have to necessarily buy into the reality of their own imaginings, like someone who's suffering from their own imagination does. They're not victims to their own imagination. They can learn to separate the tool of the imagination from something that's using them, and they don't have to buy into what they imagine. You can imagine anything whilst feeling very relaxed. One thing I'll often say to someone is, you know, I could right now, right now, imagine a meteorite coming in on top of me through the, through the ceiling. And I can imagine that whilst totally relaxed. So I don't have to be frightened by my imagination no matter what I imagine. Actually using the imagination and the emotions in this way can help us disentangle the two. So this is an idea that I might present to somebody in that way.
Another thing I'll sometimes do with somebody is uh, I'll talk about the imagination and I'll say, now, what I want you to do is to close your eyes. And when I clap my hands, I want you to open your eyes. And then I clap my hands when they have their eyes open and they open their eyes as, as instructed. Then I'll say, you know, now I want you to imagine me clapping my hands. And if you think that was real, then open your eyes. But if you know that it was just you imagining it, don't open your eyes. And of course, they don't open their eyes. So you're training them to really become confident about distinguishing between reality and their imagination. So when I really clap my, my, clap my eyes, when I really clap my hands, open your eyes. Now just imagine it. Okay. And they, they get used to only responding to reality. That's a very simple technique, but it can give people a real sense of confidence because they reach a pitch where they so don't trust their reality filters or perceptions over their imagination that doing something like this can actually get them focused on what's actually happening and distinguishing that from their imagination. So that's really the difference. You know, someone doesn't trust the fact that they've switched the tap off, so they have to check a hundred times and so on. And um, anyway, there's a couple of ideas there. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Art Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog, and thanks for watching.